Why is it important to share our personal stories uh, as part of activism? I'm here with Kevin, Kevin Patterson from polyrolemodels.tumblr.com and I'm Kathy Bertilli from intimacydojo.com. And Kevin, you're giving a talk at Wood, the Woodhull Se Sexual Freedom Summit this year on living out loud, sharing personal stories as activism. Can you tell, why did you choose this topic? I mean, it's it's really the only go-to move I have. I, I talk about my I talk about my personal uh, stories a lot, mm -hmm. and it comes from a, it comes from a, a place of pain. It comes from a place of activism, yeah. and I realize that like as hard as it, it as hard as it is for me to talk about some of the stuff that I go through, just like sort of being a black man in America and like trying to sort of navigate the world in that way, that I'm. I'm wired to not take a lot of things personally, and that's not like as a, as a value judgment for me or against anyone else. Just I know that I'm I'm wired to I'm I'm pretty thick thick skinned about this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but I know that my story isn't isn't isolated. Yeah. I talk about my situation because I know that for every one of me that's talking, there's a hundred other people who are feel who feel silent, who feel like they need to be they need their experiences to be validated. Yeah. So I talk. I point at stuff. I point at the good stuff, and I and I get loud about why it, why it's good. I point at the bad stuff, and I get loud about why it's bad. And sometimes people listen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the people listening are the people who have the ability to affect change. Yeah. You know. Like, so you can go ahead. Oh, I just like I I hear people using statistics a lot, and they're impactful, but it doesn't really get my heart necessarily. It's like they're numbers. Versus hearing one person's story, like their experience, it's like, it resonates at a deeper level. It's very personal at that point. It's like, oh, I can't just ignore that. That's not okay. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote the book, uh, Love's Not Colorblind, Race and Representation in Polyamorous and Other Alternative Communities. And I put a lot of statistics in where applicable. Mm -hmm. I used a lot of academic, uh, uh, acad I went really academic in places where I could, but everywhere I use people's personal stories. Yeah. Some of my stories, some were, you know, stories of um, other educators, people I know from um, polyamorous communities, kink communities, swing communities, just reaching out to say, like, I want to talk about this topic, and I know you have a personal story to share yeah. about, you know, what this topic means to you, how it was relevant in your life. And one of the things that I love so much when I speak in places is the head nods that I get. Yeah. Where I'll be, I'll, you know, I'll be speaking about how race impacts polyamory, and I'll talk about a story that's relevant to me, something very personal, and there'll be other people of color just nodding along, like, yeah, I remember when that happened to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll even jump in and say, like, yeah, I, I, hear, I hear you talking about being fetishized, let me tell you about a time where I fetishized somebody. And, or, or let me tell you about a time where I was fetishized. Yeah. And then end up being other people who jump in and say, let me tell you about a time that I did that to somebody. Yeah. I thought of being friendly and welcoming. I didn't realize that I was being oppressive. And now I feel some sort of way about it. And it's how, the, it's how these dialogues get started. I mean, yeah. number, I mean, I feel like in a lot of cases, if you torture the numbers long enough, they'll tell you anything you want to hear. Yeah, who is it? Who, what, what are you excluding? What are you leaving in? What, what demographic are you considering? Yeah. Are we talking about amounts? Are we talking about percentages? You know, what, what are we doing here? A lot of times, and I, put, I still put that in the book mm -hmm. because there are people who relate that way. There are people who learn that way. Yeah. But I learn and I teach by way of just telling people my story. Like, I wrote a whole book about race and polyamory and a lot of it is just me talking about myself. Yeah. I, I feel like I've been on every podcast over like the last year and it's all just me talking about myself. And it has an impact because there are people who need to hear that. Yeah. There are people who need to be educated by it and there are people who need to be validated by it. Yeah. Well, you, you have a way of looking at your own experiences. I've, 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 shared, I've heard you share stories and I love how you, you're able to look at it and see it at a very, you have a lot of clarity and also vulnerability when you share it. That it's not, I think a lot of humans, myself included, we want to like, oh, let's put it over there. It's kind of painful. I don't want to have to be too close to it. And you're willing to just, you have a beautiful courage and you step into the story and you're willing to share the experience in a way that really touches people and that inspires people too. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really trying out here. And it's, the, the thing about talking about the kind of topics that I talk about, 
there's never a shortage of things to, to, to bring up. Um, a friend of mine recently went to a book signing, uh, a local book signing here in the Philadelphia area, and she's seen me talk about race and polyamory a number of times. Mm -hmm. And she, she, and like, I don't, I don't uh, begrudge anyone who's like, you know what, Cap? I've heard you say that stuff before. I'm out of here. Yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to go to another session or go to a different event. Yeah. But this one friend, she comes, she comes to my workshop every time she can. And she's like, I know I've heard Kev talk about these same stories over and over, but I, I'm interested. Yeah. And then she she uh, she posted something on Facebook where she was like, I went to Kev's workshop and I was like, oh wow, Kev's got new stories. And it's like, oh no, Kev's got new stories. Mm, yeah. All of these are coming from like this place of pain and hurt and, and, and oppression. And every time I've got something new to tell, it's because I had to suffer something else. Well, and, this the last couple of years have been really tough. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, so sorry. I'm much better at laughing than crying. So like, I put a smile on my face. I laugh a lot of it all for everything. Every, for everything that I talk about and I remember, there's like a, there's a dozen things that I've already forgotten. Yeah. But you know, but even still, like that's some that's my role in this. My role is to is to be that face front guy talking about this because somebody needs to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. And for people that are experiencing it too, it feels so empowering. Like I know when I talk to other women of size or, and they're like, yeah, I've had people fetishize me or I've, I've had people, I've had this experience. I feel less alone. I feel less like isolated. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it sucks that it happened to other people. Um, and I, I, I'm not at all implying I know your experience because I, I'm just, I think our culture is, needs to be taken out to the woodshed. But, um, <laughs> Uh, I do know the, how good it feels when I find someone, oh yeah, me too. And we can yeah. survive this together and we can share techniques and approaches. Um, now my, my blog, Poly Role Models, since it's like an interview series, is people just sort of telling their stories. Mm -hmm. And something that I've been bringing up in a lot of workshops lately is at some point during the blog's history, a woman wrote in and she was, uh, she was talking about being bisexual and polyamorous. And she was saying, you know, that there's this ongoing stigma against bisexuals, especially bisexual women, that they're greedy or confused and like they just want to sleep with all the people. And that you know, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you know, I'm polyamorous because I can't handle monogamy. What <laughs> about how she has to navigate her polyamory and her bisexuality through that stigma? Yeah. But another woman, also bisexual, wrote in and said. I'm bisexual and I am greedy and I do want to hook up with all the people <laughs> and I navigate like I navigate around the respectability politics of dismissing that stigma because that stigma although it is a stigma it accurately identifies this other woman yeah you know and she she identifies that way and she and she's okay with it that way mm -hmm. so in both cases there's somebody who needed to hear that to feel validated there's yeah. somebody who really hates that stigma that that wants to hear other people throwing it off, and there's other people who really embrace it that need to find that other that they're that they're not broken or a bad bisexual by embracing. It. Yes, yeah, and bad bisexuals are you know well sometimes they're fun. <laughs> I I'm sure I have no idea. <laughs> um, Kevin, why are you why did you choose Woodhull as your venue for sharing this this time? Something um, something that I've noticed with Woodhull is all right. So I'm a gamer, so I'm gonna I'm gonna geek out for a second. Okay, please. Um, a, a few years back when they announced the Xbox One uh -huh. um, as a as an upcoming console, a lot of the features that they announced, people had had real serious problems with. Oh really? Like just the way it was like um, the the way it was supposed to be like a media hub, the way it was gonna supposed to be always online to get the full functionality. Um, your ability to trade games back and forth with friends. There was a lot of things that they brought up that people had issues with. And then Sony announced the PlayStation 4, and in the press conference where they announced it, they addressed every single thing that people had issues with with the Xbox. They're like, oh, by the way, problems with trading games? Nope, just hand the game to your friend. No big deal. Always online? Nope. You can be online whenever you feel like it, or not at all. <laughs> just like, you just addressed it. Point by point, this is where Xbox is screwing up. We're getting every one of those things right. Nice. And it's something that I've seen with Woodhull 
and that there were I've seen I've seen the organizers address criticisms of other conferences, mm -hmm. you know, and say, well, I hear people complaining about blah 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 at some other place. We're gonna try to do that right here. And like no one ever gets it all the way right, right. you know. No, you know, there's always there's always room to grow, but there's a way to approach hearing that you need to grow that I feel Woodhull gets correct. Yeah. Even if you get it right, if you say, hey, you didn't get this thing right, I would expect to be heard, I would expect it to be addressed. And that, that goes a long way. It creates a really, for me, it creates a really safe space where I feel like you can try, I can go to someone and say, I'm not sure, I heard this thing, am I using this correctly? Or yeah. or for people to gently say, hey, you could, you could say this better. And I, I want that. I mean, like I said, like, I've got just that one signature move of pointing at stuff and getting loud about it. And I've been, I've been all, all over the country this year touring my book, doing book signings, and I've been to conferences where I've been given a platform and I'll call out the conference or I'll call in the conference and say like, hey, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for handing me this microphone. But also, let me tell you about some things that could have got, that could have gone better. Yeah. And there are places, and like for the most part, people have listened. There are some places where they won't. Yeah. You know, there are places where if I say like, "Hey, thank you for giving me this microphone, but you got this thing wrong here," I'd be disinvited. Yeah, and then nobody grows in that case. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't feel like that's the case with Woodhull. And the, yeah, thank you for the platform, but also let me tell you about yourself and, yeah. and sort of. That's enough of a signature move that I think everyone already expects that from me. Yeah. Well, and I can see people at Woodhull pulling up a chair with their pen and paper or their computer, like, okay, tell us. We want to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, you, you keep teasing about this, having this one signature move. I think you actually have a number of them. But um, thank you for your courage and your willingness to, I mean, that's a lot of labor to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to stand up again. Like, thank you for doing that. I, I really appreciate you saying that. Like, it, like I said, it's it it comes from a lot of different places. I I walk a lot of it off. I laugh a lot of it off. But like, some of it's residual. Some of it yeah. sticks. Yeah. No, I think it does. You're. I think you're making a beautiful difference. I love. I love your book. I love your blog. I, I mean, you're you're role modeling a lot of beautiful things for people that this can be normal and natural, and you don't have to look a certain way to be a certain thing. So. Yeah. I, I, your your signature move is working really well in my book. Um, I'm, I'm really trying. I know, I know. How, I see, I see you. Um, if someone wanted, if someone's watching this and they want to have, do you have any resources or last tips you want to share before we wrap this up? Um, resources in finding me or resources in just sort of in general? Both, like around activism, finding you. Um. Well, I I, I hate to like just sort of push my own thing here but like um part of the part of poly role models that i really like is that i give people sort of room to to push their own products like my platform is your platform so like the the person who would read bisexual woman a and think wow this person i really identify with this person at the bottom of that interview is whatever blogs or projects or websites or forums that they're a part of you know and I use that to, to sort of push a lot of educators, push a lot of people, push a lot of blogs, push a lot of projects out into the, into the space. So, like, I want Poly Role Models to be as much a, a resource center as an interview series. And I, I leave a lot of room for that. Well, there's a, it's definitely a labor of love. I loved interviewing with you. You made it so easy and fun. And then you made sure everyone saw it. So thank you. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I put I, I posted it all over the place, mm -hmm. and you know I I really like hearing people follow up. Where I went to Poly Dallas Millennium uh -huh. last year, and there was a woman there who sh she showed up to every session. Uh -huh. She let herself be, she let her voice be heard in every session. She was one of the stars of the show there, and I was speaking with her after the conference, and she was like, "Yeah, I didn't even hear about this conference until I read about it on Poly Role Models." Oh, wow. and I was like. Yes. <laughs> it's working. It's working. Impact made. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time today. I, I'm hoping we're finished in time for the game so that you can get off and relax some because you deserve it. 
Yeah, and I, I can't wait to see you in August. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, no problem at all. I can't wait to see you as well.